Welcome back to Music History 601. Today, we're continuing last week's conversation about 20th century ragtime and its legacy while also recontextualizing Artie Matthews and his world as it connects to ours today. We'll also discuss how we as musicians and music institutions should move forward with this knowledge in arming ourselves for the future of performance. So let's get right back into it. Here's today's episode. So, give you a brief overview of Artie Matthews. He was a, a really interesting person. He was obviously African American, like we talked about earlier. He was a composer, a pianist, music educator, church musician, and really recognized for um, his contributions to ragtime, which we'll get into a little bit. Born in Illinois, he eventually moved to St. Louis and Chicago, where he really um, got into ragtime a lot and then eventually moved to Cincinnati in 1915. And he, it's kind of interesting because the reason he moved to Cincinnati was to be a church organist, so he kind of changed everything. Hmm. And then him and his wife started the Cosmopolitan School in 1921, which he then worked at until he died. So, has his foot in a lot of fun. He died in 1958. So like two years after Henry Fillmore. Yes. Yeah. So let's get into a little bit about his music because I think the reason that I'm doing Artie Matthews and the reason that I was inspired to do this project, like I mentioned earlier, is that I want to give more information about people that are overlooked, in this case because of his skin color, mm. um, especially after your presentation on... Henry Fillmore, it's just really interesting because like, we have like a, we, a guy trying to make his way through and, and navigating really tough waters of Jim Crow into his death right around the time of desegregation. So there's a lot that he has to unpack and carry and a community that is against him. Just flat out, no. <laughs> yeah, just, just flat out against him. And I think like the, the thing you were talking about earlier of like, activism and like how like yeah. just the simple act of existing being activism like yeah it's just even like the idea of like he was just he was a good man who just wanted to live a good life but it's just like why is that profound and right so like right in that in and of itself is it causes a weird echo chamber which i think is something in academics like we have a hard time unpacking yeah and like and absolutely I, I think that's where we are well and it's it's just I mean, and we can get more into this, but like just this comparison of having like, and it, I touched on this earlier in your thing, and it just really hits me over and over again, is Henry Fillmore using black culture and music, probably, I mean, I don't want to make assumptions, but maybe stealing some things. I mean, I would imagine stealing has to be involved, right? Like, yeah. Versus someone who's like working to help and educate and create compositions that sort of mark um, a culture and really give them a space to be recognized, uh, have we have no information on. So like, great. Yeah, and, and that's fascinating. I mean, because like you got the businessman versus the community leader, and so it's just like, I, isn't that in and of itself also like a age old American tale? One hundred percent. And also, yeah. think about this, like, I don't know when, I, I mean, you and I have talked a little bit about our families, but I think he died in 1958. My grandparents were alive. This wasn't like, we're not talking like no. 1800s. We're talking like, we don't have information from what, like, say 50, 60 years ago. But like, we got plenty of information on Mozart, like, boy died a long time ago. Like, it just, it, it's hard. Even to me, like as a kid, like growing up, I thought Mozart was close, was more of a contemporary to us than like Artie Matthews or ever knowing anything about Scott Joplin. I thought literally Scott Joplin was before Beethoven. Right. Because it's just like this perception that because we don't have this information, they're not these well-known characters that it must have just been really, really, really far away. Right. And in the reality, it's just that because of the way society functions, they're just overlooked. Mm, yeah. And... They were, I mean, prior to this is like, um, you weren't even considered a human. So this makes, it, it perfectly makes sense. Right. Like, yeah. You know, they're like, well, when you look at it that way, I, there's some. <laughs> right. 
just, you know, America's sad, sad past. And then I think this goes back to the reason we're doing this is that we're, you know, in order to acknowledge where we're at, we have to acknowledge where we came from and face yeah. the music. Face the yeah. music. Face the music. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Is that a tagline? <laughs> I hear it. Merch, well, merch, merch, merch. Merch, merch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's get into this. So, short, brief overview over ragtime. We all know Scott Joplin. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Missouri. Lambert's is a place that is kind of like an upscale Cracker Barrel where they make homemade rolls and they throw them at you. Oh. And you catch them. Oh. But there's always an old lady playing the entertainer on repeat at Lambert's. Oh. Okay? So if any of our listeners have been to Lambert's, shout out to that lady. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the biggest name that we know in ragtime is Scott Joplin with tunes like Entertainer, Maple Leaf Rag. We've all learned that in music history. You know, shout out. Okay. Of course. Um, he's the king of ragtime. However, um, the... Scott Joplin came a little bit before Artie Matthews, but they lived at the same time. And I, I would, I want to say that they maybe have crossed paths when he was in St. Louis. Yeah, I couldn't imagine though that it didn't happen because just of like how you realize like black communities are connected yeah. and like how early days of jazz getting its start through ragtime, like that had to be like being passed back and forth between these communities. I imagine. Yes. And I would say um, with ragtime and with jazz, um, and I'll get more into this too, um, the, the transition into jazz is that these were seen as like uh, predominantly black genres. Mm -hmm. So um, Artie Matthews becomes important into the ragtime scene because he starts moving away from the traditional ragtime and does something a little bit more jazzy, we can say. Uh, Dr. Meyer and I had a really good conversation about how we could see Artie Matthews as kind of getting into like some weird pre-bebop thing because he does Ooh. all these cluster chords. Yeah, and so... He really was just ahead of his time. He really was. He's really cool. Yeah. We're going to put him in the second generation of ragtime is what we're going to call it. So, some of his ragtime's most famous ones are pastime rags one through five. They're kind of the biggest contribution written right. at different years. Some when he was in St. Louis, some when he moves to Cincinnati. And actually through them, you can sort of hear it get a little bit more um, experimental in certain ways, okay, which is exciting. Yeah. I'm not going to play all of them today, but I will play some, so be ready. Mm, yes. um, but I think uh, what makes his music unique is he really truly is making, I don't think he knew it at the time, but there really is such a bridge transition that you can hear from this to jazz and eventually i think louis armstrong records one of his compositions later so that's kind of cool so there's a good, good connection oh, okay cool. so old good old ragtime is something that most people can play at home it's very it's more popularized because it just has cool walking bass pattern um, what do we have? Like syncopations, but there's always typically a melody that you will remember and hold on to, and it's very like dance like. That, if anybody could play With part, piano. is if you were born in the turn of the. <laughs> at the turn of the 18th to 19th century and maybe <laughs> if you were one of the lucky kids in the 90s whose parents kind of still believed in the idea yeah, I'm of not getting one of those. your child <laughs> we are not yeah we would be very clear we're yeah, not yeah. those people uh i in fact when i got to ccm had to take the piano uh, exam yeah, the piano exam failed it and then had to take a year of piano <laughs> I, i'm great at piano now but again really I'm all right. Dr. Michelle Conda, shout out to a queen. Oh, okay. But Marty Matthews' compositions kind of get a little bit more avant-garde. We get some chromatic runs. There's tango rhythms. And in Ragtime 4, which we'll listen to a little bit, and we listen to in class, is known for some dissonant tone clusters. Very bebop. Yeah. And, like, virtuosic. Very virtuosic, very different. Which I like, and I think he was trying to carve out a space for himself. Marty. Oh my god, can that be his nickname though? Marty? What is this, Back to the Future? Okay. Is that not um, what this podcast is? The time continuum, Marty! <laughs> I 
I'm going to play just a few seconds of Maple Leaf Rag. Any non-musician listeners, I promise you you've heard this at some point in your life, so you'll hear it right away. I want you guys to hear the comparison between old school ragtime, second gen ragtime, okay? It was on Looney Tunes. It definitely was on like Animaniacs. Yeah. It definitely wasn't like every animated show in the '90s, early 2000s, late yes. '80s, like those Tom and Jerry. 100. Like it was there. 100. Yeah. percent So in this one, we hear that the the melody we all know, and it's something that is catchy and it's very danceful music. Um, clear form that stays throughout, and it it has a lot of repeating. Themes and melodic gestures and all that stuff. Okay, now we're gonna switch into Pastime Rag Number One, which was co uh, composed in 1913, prior to him moving to Cincinnati. So let's hear this one. There's a lot more syncopation, which he's known for, Arnie Matthews, and it's a little bit more virtuosic. And then there's these weird grace notes that happen in the bass line that make it almost sound wrong, which I like. So, it's kind of a bop. That was a... And the thing about it, too, is just, like, it almost reminds me of... I don't know if you guys are familiar, um, but it reminds me of Ravel's La Valse when he breaks down the waltz. Mm, like, at yes. the end, when it just falls apart. It's yes. like Artie Matthews is taking a genre and sort of flipping it on its head and then trying to explore this new identity of it. Much like what he's experiencing in the community. He's sort of just being like, I'm going to carve my own space. That makes total sense. Like even Dvorak says, which is like why we used his, uh, his symphony, his New World Symphony as our intro music, is because like, you know, Dvorak as a musicologist, when he came to America, he did the same work that like Percy Granger and like those other and like Gustav Hulse and all of them were doing with like going through the countryside of England and getting these folk tunes and bringing them back and reiterating them to the stage. Dvorak said that the first people of this of our country were the indigenous people and, and the African slaves and that all culture from there is kind of renewed through those communities because it is taking the bits and pieces of the larger or the, the quote-unquote dominant Western society that is keeping these people in this place and then reusing those bits of culture to redo them and to reuse them and respin them into a new genre. I mean, right. like, that's what jazz is. It's the, it's, it's the blending of Western instruments, Western notation, Western uh, ideas about harmonic function. And right. on their head, and turning them on their head with ideas of syncopation, ideas of inverting chords, the idea of how we like right. really playing with and querying the idea of what chords are good to go to and what chords are not good to go to. And I think that's something that um, this is a bigger general thing to talk about that I'm just going to throw in, but we can all think about is just like we, I mean, the weight of being a black musician has got to be insurmountable because we're asking you because we're steel so then you have to reinvent yourself and then we steal and then you have to reinvent yourself over and over and over again and so like it is remarkable that people like even have the the passion or the drive to like want to still create because it's like you're never acknowledged and then on top of that someone still takes your ideas familiar with like Greek myth in general? A little, I mean like, you know, fourth grade. <laughs> Are you aware of the character Sisyphus? Like, maybe, maybe not. Okay. I don't know. Explain. Basically, like, the idea of Sisyphus was just like, he's being punished for always being more clever than the gods and always outthinking the gods. And so eventually what they do is they say, all right, well, in your, he negotiates this weird deal about the afterlife and get, being able to go to Elysium, but they somehow like double, they double cross his double cross and they end up with him like 
constantly every day in hell and that as soon as he gets to the top is that just as i was about to make the surmount and actually push the boulder over the hill it rolls back down over him and goes back to the bottom but right. there's this idea that in the greek myth and in some retellings of it the idea that okay sisyphus gets a kind of fiendish pleasure out of this by reproving to the gods over and over again that I won't give up, I will push this up the hill. And right. maybe, just maybe, one day I'll push it over the edge, but I'm doing it almost in spite of the gods wanting this to fail. And I think that that's a very, like, black place to be. And it makes a lot of sense, and this is why you know, like, I think I, we hear the argument a lot um, in the present from white people is like, why are you mad? This happened so long ago. Like, I'm not responsible for you being, for you, your ancestors having gone through this. Like we said, 60-ish years ago, maybe a little bit more, like, but like... Not even a lifetime ago. No, like, it's crazy. And I think the thing that we can do is this is educating ourselves and showing giving a voice to these people listening to their music trying to find other people that have contributed to music and really calling out people like henry okay. Fillmore. there are two points that i can like what you just said it was a very rich statement uh so like one like not even a lifetime ago like you're pointing out like this was like the story only kind of ended 60 years ago but like Okay, let's put it this way. My dad is 70. So if my dad is 70, he is older than this story. We have de we definitely have professors who are at that age where they were 100%. the generation that got the Henry Fillmore story instead of the Artie Matthews story. And that's why it still affects us today because those professors are now our Correct. professors and they are the ones who are controlling the what we understand to be the canon. And... And, and yes. so, like, I mean, that's a very, and, and so, like, it only got called into question, arguably, you know, since the turn of the new century, and since the civil rights movement, but, like, arguably, again, in this, like, this recent, like, kind of 2020 reckoning over race and how we understand right. uh, these systems to kind of perpetuate themselves. And then we go back over and over again, right. we have to look and we go, oh, that keeps happening. Because even like the story of like Ragtime, we really only associate Scott Joplin with it and then someone like Henry Fillmore. And we think that, oh, they invented it, but white people really like made it something. What more should we know about Artie Matthews? I guess it's just really frustrating because there's just not information on it. Like we talked about in class how we can't even find an exact location of where the school existed in Cincinnati, but that a lot of people went in there and it was such a staple in this community and it helped provide education to aspiring black musicians. Um, and so for me, someone like that, that is working against uh, the status quo and against society to try and create opportunities um, for not only himself, which kind of like Henry Fillmore was kind of vibing with is like working for himself. Um, he was trying, Artie Matthews was trying to change his community. The thing is, is that the school never becomes accredited. And I think perhaps one of the reasons is because it dies right as desegregation happens right around, uh, when Brown v. Board was settled. So I wonder if what happened was that after his death and after desegregation, there's not these programs anymore and there's no thought to the way that planning goes in for like expanding cities. So you don't have these programs, you desegregate, then you, it's almost like, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same. It's just a cycle on the larger scale. Mm, you're, yeah. you're, you're really overlooking an entire community by expanding these schools and then there's no lasting um, roots from these people that have laid them down. And then you get a, a university like here at CCM who gets accredited and then absorbs everything. But of course, not not the black students or the black community or anything like that. So there's basically mm, very little information on the school. Artie Matthews had a son named Art Matthews who has a little bit about it on his website. And here and there it's mentioned so I found uh, 
this address for like where it used to be and like yeah. so right now it is very purely just a vocational rehab building this okay. is like right by kind of it's by city hall it's like behind city hall and but like i i live kind of in that area ish and like there are no plaques there are no okay there there is nothing that would ever indicate that this was the space that right. this is the this is the site Mentioned. where the first black owned and operated music and survey in the united states was was it just existed and it's just it's simply just right beside gateway plaza which is uh which is a high rise but you know what but the interesting thing too is that like a high rise and this particular high rise has uh is, is pretty much all black Great. so it's just like so we've continued the legacy of where we put people but we have not continued a legacy of or started a legacy of acknowledging our history our collective shared history well and i think you know a lot of people are like so i mean first of all desegregation happened civil rights um i know like plenty of my family members were alive at this point my parents actively desegregated schools when they were children. Right. My grandparents were in school at T.C. Williams. Don't know if y'all have seen Remember the Titans. Like, oh kind God. of not act historically yeah. accurate, but like D.C. area that time. And the thing is, is that that the, the, the horrible thing about desegregation is that you're like, you finally give what seems like equality but then you don't help them at all and then it just like further segregates this cultural divide and like actually um, builds up the like poverty divide now too correct and like correct. makes it worse if you're familiar with cincinnati i mean let's just take a little walk down otr like famously and, and, and we come in after you know and we let these places uh that we don't help after desegregation get see poverty and then we come in and we're like let's gentrify it and make it white again so it, it's just a constant state of our history not giving credit and not helping and not um recognizing and that is why i think that this is a really good episode to compare um two musical figures but sort of show these larger ideas because this is exactly what we're talking about and it's represented in two people living at the same time who the only real difference is like the color of their skin um, and sort of what that means and their differences of opportunities and their differences of legacies. Like all American, all forgotten. Right, <laughs> That's really right, what right. we got here. I mean, it's all American, right? The, yeah. Yeah, it's all American. It's all American. <laughs> well, an interesting thing too is that like, so like uh, if you're familiar with Cincinnati, Cincinnati has a symphony orchestra, but like, Turns out, like, Artie Matthews was also an arranger for the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Right. So, like, are we doing, like, as an institution, as a musical institution that does still have a claim, are we doing enough to shine, to really shed light on our own history, right? Like, it's not like we're saying, it's not like any, like, by saying, acknowledging Artie Matthews, it's we're going out of our way. No, we're simply saying, a part of Artie Matthews was a part of Cincinnati history. A huge Dr. part. Artie Matthews was a major part of music of the musical scene in Cincinnati. There, thus, the musical scene of 20th century America. Yeah, I mean, he even like organized and produced a Negro music f festival. Like, correct. He, he had he had his foot in every pond, and he worked so hard to to give opportunities to people that were not afforded them even though he himself carved this own space the but like like our, like henry fillmore like the idea with him is just that like he had a printing press that was given to him almost right. basically as like a graduation gift from ccm and then yeah. he proceeded to make his own market that he then racketeered by putting out false like by writing under pseudonyms and yes i understand that people write under pseudonyms but the way that he used the pseudonym was a way to lift his own table of how much money he was bringing in and to preserve his name he had the opportunity to preserve his name right 
and Artie Matthews was never given the opportunity. Well, he was given plenty of opportunity, and he took many opportunity and made many opportunity to preserve right. his name. However, his name was not preserved as well as it should have been. Absolutely. And I think that this is just, this, this shows us that as you know, 21st century people living in 2020, educate yourselves. Like, find information about people. When you hear a name, look them up. Look up what music you're playing. Look up all of these things because it's, I, I think now about like the fact that as a child, I was singing songs that really, I mean, those verses, like. And like, and this, the whole idea too of like, oh, what does that mean we can't play it anymore? It's like, I don't know if that means you can't play it anymore. Right. But I know it, is, I know it definitely means you probably shouldn't perform this anymore. Like it doesn't, music education is bigger than a stage. Let's just put it that way. Music education is larger than the, the 30 to 45 to an hour long concert that you put on every few weeks or every right. week. It's more than that. It's about the musicians who are inside of that ensemble learning about their collective history about being inside of that ensemble. And part of our history is the nigga smears from Henry Fillmore and from right. Fillmore Music House that gave us Lassus Trombone and Moose Trombone and Slim Trombone, all right. using uh, act, uh, adjectives like colored and dealing with right. the minstrel band. Like, we have to acknowledge that's what it also well, is. You can't just remove a verse or remove the name or remove the association and just be like, it's cool. It, you have to take the full weight of what it was. You have to sit with it. And like, I, I don't think, I, I'm not of the camp of just erasing history and being like, uh, we just need to say sorry for everything and get rid of it all. It's more like you have to acknowledge what it was and really just understand the full weight of that because that's what yeah. people in the black community have had to do for years. And no one has said like, we acknowledge you, <laughs> you, you know, right, I mean, but just... like, and then also live with like the knowledge that we have always been part of this history, but it has been the, the, the basically the access to being American has been denied to us in a social way. Right. Like, because, like, clearly we are important to the band world because Ragtime found its way into the, to the band canon and people really want to keep it around. But why not arrange an Artie Matthews thing that was already a better quality because that's the thing that was being emulated, or sorry, being imitated, cheaply imitated by right. Fillmore. And, and so, like, it's the same thing, too. It's like, and then, but... but Artie Matthews also had a, a conservatory in a, you know, a, a in a city that had many conservatories, so it must have been also good. Meaning, and it was serving the black community. Meaning, there must have been black community members who were also good musicians because he was also a westernly trained musician who also believed in the idea of mixing those two genres and those two styles and traditions. So, like should have been there should have been more musicians of like black musicians who were allowed to be inside of ccm but the doors closed and so from then on musicians weren't allowed to be anything other than white for a long time Correct. so i think that's the other thing too is like moving forward is like well how do we reintegrate something that already was never that never should have been segregated out right well, and I think it's it's doing both. It's it's I think in a way as a form of activism is calling calling out so, like not just going with what you know. It's it's calling out some artists that are not even alive anymore and being like, hey, this is what this what's up with this. But it's also the positive side is bringing forward like this is a great example. Again, two people that live at the same time, completely different lives. Uh, someone who is composing and trying to make a name for not not I not even a name for himself. I think like make a space for yeah. people outside of himself, um, and then someone who is doing it just to get. I mean, like in our society, views. <laughs> I mean, that's just what it is. So these equal money. Yeah.
So we just have to do more of this. And I think it's really cool to kind of see the comparisons because I think it, it shows you more the gravity of what the damage of someone like Henry Fillmore does and how we can see um, current examples of that and what you can relate that to. And then someone like Artie Matthews, like it, there's such a contrast here. And I think the more that we do that and call attention to these sort of things, the more we can um, work and avoid that in the future. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. break down the system. Switcheroni, let's get it going here, folks. Switch, switcheroni. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as all the new academics who are pulling themselves together in the middle of this pandemic and realizing that academic is not just a noun, it's a verb, yes. and realizing that we're going to be making headway as a generation, let's do it, you know? Yes, yes. Come on, millennials. Come on, Gen Z. Oh God, I'm never going to roll call. <laughs> you can leave. No, it's staying in. I, I think it's a good place okay. to end it. Absolutely. I, I've said a lot. You've said a lot. Put it out there. You guys go home and think about it. We'll look forward to reading your dissertations and or comments or you know, other podcasts. Thanks. Take care of yourselves. Um, wear your masks. What else do I want to plug? You know, just vibe at home for a while. 10 out of 10, vibe at home with your circle. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next time. Peace.